So I've been working as a cognitive behavior therapy practitioner in addictions uh, for 19 years, and I've been researching addictive behaviors within a university context for around about 16, 17. Um, when I started working as a cognitive behavior therapy practitioner, I was dissatisfied with cognitive behavior therapy um, to an extent. It's clearly uh, an effective form of uh, treatment for a wide variety of uh, psychological problems, and it's especially effective for anxiety and mood-related problems. For addictive behavior, however, the evidence, as we'll see in a minute, I'll briefly touch upon it, is, is reasonable, but not excellent. And above all, relapse rates are quite high. Indeed, motivational interviewing is probably a, a better intervention standalone than cognitive behavior therapy is, and it's much more cost effective. And here I'm talking about individual therapy rather than group based therapy. So, CBT, an effective therapy, especially for anxiety and for depression, um, reasonably effective in reducing addictive behaviors. I've just undertaken a systematic review, and the results are not that excellent if we look at the last 15 years. So there is definitely scope for improvement. However, even in the case of cognitive behavior therapy, residual symptoms remain powerful. And craving is consistently found to be a residual um, experience, whatever you want to call it, if one wants to pathologize it, symptom. So what is craving? It's uh, a powerful subjective experience, which typically motivates us to achieve the craved target. It's been conceptualized in many ways. This is in, a, in some sense technical, but also not technical at all, because we, we know what this is about. Intrusive thought, which is the classic cognitive explanation, a sort of drive, a felt sense of motivation, substance, substance wanting, which is another permutation of, um, of this um, motivational state, an emotional state, a powerful emotional state characterized by a sense of deprivation, uh, physical sensations, and a stress response. What is common to all of this? Intrusion. It's intrusive craving. Especially if we're not expecting it, and especially if we think that it's bad to have this state, and we don't want it, or don't want to experience it. Where does cra craving come from? Uh, we have as many uh, theories of where it comes from as people who've managed to establish academic careers. <laughs> because it's important you repackage things, you know? The previous generation has forgotten about it, so you repackage it. And then you have an academic career. Are you recording me? Yes, I'm saying the truth. <laughs> Good. Not entirely true, but partially true. So where does it come from? Neural systems or automated response systems? Similar to conditioning processes. So conditioning processes are very powerful and we're all aware of them. High order cognitive functioning, expectancies, believing that there are benefits in using in order to control or engaging in addictive behaviors in order to control craving or emotional states, propositional networks, problem solving aspects of interrupted addictive sequences. The last one in particular is interesting. We we follow automated paths uh, when we're addicted, and when these are interrupted, we experience powerful craving. Now, to me, all this is interesting, and I appreciate that a lot of academic work has gone into it. But the fact we understand, to an extent, why we have intrusions doesn't mean we know how to manage them. They're all plausible explanations of the origins of craving. So why does it escalate? We all experience craving. Why does, for a reasonably large amount of uh, individuals, why does craving escalate to an extent where then engagement and use follow? So a possible explanation you've come up with, uh, and I would want to say that this is my idea, because in academia the currency is ideas, but it's a shared idea. Yeah? <laughs> with my PhD student in particular. So it was his idea with my input, which was important. <laughs> uh, 
And now, over the course of time, it's become our idea. <laughs> so we worked together and tried to come up with a construct that would parallel what we've got in the anxiety and mood disorders. So in modern, the modern understanding of cognitive behavior therapy is that, again, intrusive thoughts about, for example, anxiety and mood are to an extent unimportant. But what really matters is how we manage them through the processes of worry and rumination. Indeed, worry and rumination are the best predictors of relapse in both anxiety and depression. So again, we can all have disturbing thoughts, but as long as we don't ruminate, we are less likely to be depressed. As long as we don't worry, we're less likely to become anxious long term. And there was a piece to this puzzle missing. As long as we don't desire as an active mental behavior, we might be able to crave less, as you'll see, and not relapse. So we have a, almost a triad of worry, rumination, and desire thinking. What if? Why? If only I could. And these activities can be seen as mental behaviors. So what is desire thinking? A style of thinking involving the positive elaboration of a craved target. I tried to, to make it less jargony than it's been in all the various journals I've published in. So the conscious and intentional processing of pleasant consequences, what I call film, the film. You have the film even in worry and rumination. What if something were to go wrong? Then, what then, and then, and then. You're playing a film in your mind. The same with rumination. Why did I do this? What was wrong? When I left that meeting, was I drooling? When I said bye? at the bar, was I drooling? Yeah, if I was, how did, how did I react? That's rumination. Very prevalent in social anxiety. As soon as you stop rumination, social anxiety retracts. So this conscious filmmaking, internal filmmaking of the benefits and consequences of using. Then the self-talk that was mentioned before, reviewing good reasons for attaining the desired target. And finally, some form of semi-implicit roadmap of planning. The image, Richmond, evening, 28 degrees possible in Richmond in the evening now, thanks to global warming. The pint, dripping, good reasons, you know, at the end of the week, as we mentioned earlier on. There are good reasons to do this, you know, I need a reward. It's this internal talk, and then the actual planning begins. Now, the, this whole process will become habitual over time. And as you will see, the therapeutic interventions that I'll, I am testing at the moment are all about making this process less habitual, about people becoming disgustingly self-conscious about what they're doing. Because desire thinking is a behavior. Craving is an intrusion. Worry is a mental behavior. A disturbing thought is simply an intrusion. So we know that craving and desire thinking are separate. If we look at questionnaires that measures both, people will give answers that indicate that there's only a 30% overlap between craving, 40% between craving and desire thinking. We know uh, that Craving and desire thinking independently predict outcomes. So what do we know about desire thinking? It's present across addictive behaviors. I've done many studies that show that this construct as separate from craving, this voluntary cognitive elaboration type activity is present across all addictive behaviors. Alcohol use, gambling, nicotine use, problematic internet use. Yeah. It typically predicts engagement in addictive behaviors, controlling for mood controlling for craving, as I said, and controlling for how much the person engages in addictive behavior. So it predicts how much a person engages, controlling for the mood, controlling for craving, and controlling for the levels of use or engagement. I use the term engagement because I'm referring to, for example, problematic use of the phone or gambling, which are engagements rather than use. What do we know? the more people have the tendency to engage in desire thinking, 
as measured by the desired thinking questionnaire, the more likely they are to uh, focus their attention on triggers for craving. We have done now a longitudinal study, which might not be liked by people who are pure cognitive therapists, showing that permissive beliefs, you know what they are, yeah? One more won't harm me. I will start on Monday, 1st of January. If it's a Thursday, I might as well wait until Monday 10th. So it's a nice round number to start, to stop. When I finish the pack. When I finish the pack. <laughs> so we know now that desire thinking at time one predicts permissive beliefs in the future. So this means that if we were to moderate desire thinking or reduce it, permissive beliefs should start to weaken. It affects decision making, it biases our decision, we've done studies on that. So the higher the, the, levels, of the uh, higher the levels of desire thinking, the more likely we are to make decisions, those apparently irrelevant decisions that make us use or engage more. And finally, it brings to physiological stress responses, which I mentioned, it appears to be more important than craving itself. So we did a study, and we've replicated this with clinical populations, where we asked people to engage in verbal reasoning or distraction activities or desire thinking. These were individuals who did not have any particular addictive behavior. We just asked them to tell us about something they sometimes struggle managing with. It could be food, it could be uh, drinking, but in moderate amounts. And we managed to incubate craving um, by manipulating desire thinking. So desire thinking, we got them to engage in desire thinking with quite complicated tasks, which I'm not going to explain now, now. But desire thinking had a significant effect on craving. And this was independent of the original craving, the perception of how stressful the task was during this manipulation. In other words, we managed to incubate craving by manipulating desire thinking. And we've done this also in clinical populations. There are many other studies that I could talk about, but I thought an experimental one is always the strongest from, from a research methods point of view. So what is it that drives it? Over the last five, six, seven years, we've um, done a series of studies looking at the beliefs people hold about this process. And we found that there are some positive beliefs that are not positive at all, but they're a bit like positive expectancies that we think we know through longitudinal studies now that the stronger these beliefs are, the more likely people are, are, li the more likely people are to engage in desire thinking longer term. So positive beliefs, imagining what I desire helps me to have greater control over my choices. If I imagine something I desire, I will feel less its absence, at least in the short term. Imagining the desired activity or object makes me feel energized. You'll see parallels here with worry. If you ask people who have problems with worry, they'll tell you, worry will help me solve problems. I've worried in the past and everything was okay. With rumination, the, the typical positive belief is, if I ruminate, I will understand. So let me put sad music on and review what happened with a goal of improving my mood. Now, what happens if you ruminate? Does your mood improve? Never. I can't. Negative beliefs are the ones that form over time. Oh my god, I've been thinking constantly about this experience of craving and imagining I can't control it. I can't stop thinking about any, I can't stop thinking at all about the fact I'm desiring this. Exactly like we have in worry. We have negative beliefs about worry. I can't stop worrying. Worrying is taking over my life. Worry becomes the problem. In the same way, this process appears to become a problem for those who are either in recovery or who have substance abuse problems. Images about what I desire come to my mind even when I would not want this to happen, and so on. So there is this complex relationship between the positive beliefs that drive people to engage in desire thinking and the negative ones that emerge that are about the lack of control. So I ask you, if you don't think you can control something, are you going to stop? Correct. So exactly 
uh, if we draw parallels with anxiety and depression, we now know that the most po powerful beliefs are predicting the outcomes on anxiety are not the content of the anxious thoughts themselves, but beliefs about control. If we can some way work on these beliefs, clients start to gradually interrupt worry, rumination, and desire thinking. And if they sh have the shift in belief to controllability, which you will get through programs such as UK Smart Recovery directly and indirectly, then it's more likely that behavior can change. So here we have a basic model. In reality, it's a little bit more complex <coughs> to satisfy the ivory tower needs of academia. But this is how it works in practice. Yeah? You, and you already have tenure, right? You already have tenure, right? Me? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what do you mean I can say anything so I want? It's OK. That they, it's OK. It's OK they make a record, right? OK, good. <laughs> uh, so, activating event. No, it's not going to be ABC, yeah? Uh, <laughs> activating event. Walking past the pub in Bristol, image of the lager. Yeah? Powerful. Craving. Oh, I want it. I miss it. Those fond memories of using it. And some beneficial consequences. Desire thinking is initiated. Play the film. Talk to yourself. Remember. Plan. All cognitive activities, cognitive behaviors, driven, as we now know from the evidence of our research, by these positive beliefs. Implicit, quite automatic, this process, but originally voluntary in nature. The consequences are good short term. Otherwise, why would one engage in such an activity, exactly as there are benefits in worrying and ruminating. Worrying, ruminating, using alcohol, avoidance, there's benefits in all of these activities if you see them as mental activities. And the benefit is that it provides a distraction from the craving because you're starting to imagine how it was those evenings when you drank, how the beer tasted. There is a temporary distraction from that upsetting state. Maybe a felt sense of control, exactly like people who have worry will tell you, well, when I start the worry process, I'm solving the problem. And pleasure. The sense of deprivation is minimized for a little while, talking about short term versus long term, minimized a little while because there's some form of hope being generated a hope for use, almost an internal cognitive method for selling good reasons why to use. The problem is that the consequences soon come to, come to consciousness, sense of deprivation, the Beckian permissive thoughts, the uncontrollability. I can't stop thinking. It was craving, now I can't stop thinking of the substance. And it feeds back into the craving. And we argue that this is the reason why craving, or one of the reasons, not to be too presumptuous, but one of the reasons why craving escalates. And the result, <coughs> habit. The result is use. We think it works like this because of the experiments we've run and because of the studies that are longitudinal in nature that predict behavior in the future by what we're measuring today. So. What are the clinical implications of this view? First and most importantly, the client needs to understand that they are an active participant in the escalation of their own craving. And this is a metacognitive perspective. They're not only slaves to the semantic nature of the uh, experiences they have, which is the classic cognitive model view of things, because you believe something, you do something. Here you're actually doing something mentally that is perpetuating the craving. So psychoeducation, differentiating craving from an action, desire thinking, outlining how the desire thinking process uh, um, works, 
highlighting the consequences of desire thinking and identifying the positive and negative beliefs, which is what I said earlier on, our belie we believe or we assume and have some evidence uh, to, to, that supports this view. We assume that they drive this process. Control, postponing desire thinking. So exactly like with craving, the key message is you're not going to be able to interrupt this activity like you can't with worry rumination immediately. And the main way of doing it is by not only being aware and postponing, but also by using two techniques. Attention training, which is a relatively new technique, which is applied for the treatment of anxiety disorders with very great success, which is about making attention flexible so that when people experience craving, they can switch in and out more easily than individuals who are stuck always monitoring their internal states and what they feel. And the other one is detached mindfulness. The mindfulness component you're aware of it, which is the observation with some distance of the experience that one has. The detachment is the purposeful awareness of what one does when one is observing. So, here, the message is observation with a, uh, with in goal, sorry, in mind, the goal of not engaging in desire thinking. So in detached mindfulness, through a series of metaphors, we try to foster the idea of observation with this commitment of non-engagement through desire thinking, worry, rumination. And these techniques should help postpone this process. It happens with worry and anxiety. It happens with rumination in depression. And we are seeing it happen with craving in people with uh, addictive behaviors. Towards the end of the interventions, we return to the beliefs about uncontrollability, utility, and we start questioning them. What are the benefits of imagining, of reviewing something that fundamentally you don't want to have? So so, some concluding thoughts. We think that desire thinking is crucial, exactly like worry and, and, and rumination are for uh, anxiety and depression. We think it's crucial in the escalation of craving. The key message today is craving, to an extent, does not matter. Exactly like intrusive thoughts and anxiety, to an extent, or depression, don't matter. It's not good to think too much about a target we don't want to achieve. And this is the link with motivation. If we've reached a point where we do want to commit to not using or engaging in a given behavior, we then probably can potentiate that motivational state by cutting the supply to desire thinking. But as long as we want to achieve that goal, it becomes harder. And the conclusion, therefore, is which is what I talk to with my clients about. Craving, or oh, craving, craving what? Craving is not the problem. <laughs> it's a problem, yes. You experience lots of distress, but it's fundamentally not what is bringing you to use again. What is bringing you to use again is this old mental habit of planning, playing the movie, imagining. And my question to you is, if your goal is to stop, how can imagining help you reach that goal? These are all the people who've been involved, and I have to thank them. Professor Adrian Wells, one of the leading fig figures in cognitive behavior therapy, and my PhD supervisor, Gabriele Caselli, my PhD student, and many other collaborators. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs>